What if I told you that the perfect society does exist? Imagine a nation where degenerates do not exist, where anyone that isn't part of the boys is a slave, and honest warmongers can finally make a living. Welcome to Sparta, also known as Heaven on Earth, and in today's installment of Impartial History, we shall be learning of the rise of the quintessence of perfection that is the Lacedaemonian state. If you're interested in this and more, be sure to like and subscribe, or I'll send the Spartan army to your house. Our tale begins in the times of the Mycenaean Empire, where Laconia was ruled by Lelex, son of the sun god Helios, who was well known among the Mycenaeans for BTFOing the local Minoans, mockingly named the Lelegies. That, and he was also a direct ancestor of the great Perseus. After Lelex, the succeeding kings of Sparta, mighty they were, all contributed to the creation of the fundamental Spartan identity to be as based as humanly possible, including Lacadamon, who gave the kingdom its actual name, but I'll call it Sparta anyway for you uneducated Agrotes. Anyway, the last of these Spartan kings was Tyrandeus, who you might recognize from part 3 as the last king of old Sparta. His life began on a low note, as he was usurped and exiled from his birthright by his usurping half minoan brother, Hippocoon. But later, and with the aid of the mighty Heracles himself, he regains the throne, later marrying an Aetolian princess named Leda. Now, this on its own wouldn't be a problem, however, Leda already had children, and what's worse is that one of these children was none other than Helen of Troy. Herondaeus already knew that Helen would be nothing but trouble, but under the influence of his new wife and probably some dark magic, he kept Helen around. Anyway, remember how Tyrandeus got usurped earlier, but he later got his throne back? Well, the same thing literally just happened to Agamemnon, alongside his brother Menelaus, and Tyrandeus married his daughters to them before taking Mycenae back from the usurping Fiestes. However, all good things must come to an end, as when Tyrandeus returned to Lacedaemon, he found that Helen was missing and a note was on the ground. And then the world ended. Anyway, in the burning hellscape that was Dark Age Greece, only a few Mycenaeans remained in the city, being the only city capable of repelling the hordes of sea people that came their way, using nothing but their bare hands. But the lack of manpower and capable men was most concerning, and so, when the Dorians came along to Laconia, the remaining Spartans said, fuck it, and teamed up with the Dorians to rebuild Sparta greater than ever. At first, it was a pain in the ass, what here with half Barbaroi and all, but slowly and surely, through rigorous training, commitment, and sometimes brute fucking force, the Dorians became almost tolerable enough to be called Spartans, and so it was that the Spartiotes were born those being the original Spartans chad enough to actually have rights. Eventually, Sparta came to encompass a number of villages in the area around Lacedaemon, forming, alongside many of its contemporaries, a polis, the premier political system of the time. Now you might be thinking, Ludovicus, isn't a polis just a Greek word for city? Well, firstly, not exactly, and secondly, get out of my head! A Greek polis wasn't just a single city, rather, it was a collection of smaller towns and villages unified under a unified state, otherwise known as a proto-nation state, governed from a place known as the Acropolis, or High Polis, based on the old Mycenaean palaces, where the temples, government institutions, and important people were held. The polis also possessed an ecclesia, or a council of all adult male citizens of the polis, where matters of state were deliberated and voted on and major decisions were made. The polis were divided into classes, citizens and slaves, citizens being the adult male population, descendants of the founding fathers of the polis, and the slaves being everyone else. Not too far from the old Mycenaean caste system, to be honest. Sparta adopted this system, and as a part of the whole multiple villages in the same polis thing, the Spartan polis uniquely possessed two basileis instead of one, with the two dynasties, the Eurypontids and the Aegeids, ruling for the good of the state. However, these political reforms would not be enough, and soon, probably due to some unruly Dorians, Sparta went through a period of lawlessness and unnecessary strife that can only be called the product of toxic democracy. And so in response, a once in a generation genius lawgiver named Saul Good- <coughs> I mean Lycurgus, 
with the aid of the Basileus, restored law and order to Sparta by beating everyone into submission and reformed Sparta into the ideal state. Lycurgus's reforms revolved around a system called eunomia, or good order in Greek, or as I like to call it, proto -juche. The system revolves around the Spartiotes, aka the original Spartans, where to become one, one must meet the three requirements to be a pure blood, to pass the agoge, and to be elected to the Sicitia. Pure blood is simple, just be born of pure Spartio parents. But things get interesting when the agoge begins, at birth, that is. Upon birth, the child is inspected for any defects or any such attributes that may hinder their abilities to act as Spartans. Should they possess any such defects? Well, consult this image for an appropriate visualization. Should the baby Spartan not have any defects though, they're accepted into the Agoge and allowed to live a normal life until the age of seven, upon which they're separated from their mothers to prevent them from becoming too empathetic. Can't have our killing machines humanize the enemy, can we? Life in the Agoge was based on the one true principle of life, survival of the fittest. Agoge candidates were forced to sleep on river grass, are only allowed to wear one cloak, and the only way they can eat is if they steal. But the Spartans ran under the principle of, it's not a crime if you're not caught. And to anyone with a bad enough case of skill issue that they get caught, they get beaten for not for stealing, but for being shit at stealing. Below the Spartiotes were the Perioikoi, aka non-important non-Spartans, that just live in the Spartan polis, and they have to pay taxes, so yeah. And below them were the Helots, also known as slaves. You see, whenever Sparta conquered some bordering rabble, they had the good sense to keep them alive instead of torching and starting over. Why? So they can enslave them, of course, using the Helots as slave farmers tied to the land, ruled over by Spartios overlords. But there's an extra reason for this policy of slavery, you know, other than be based as hell. For while the slaves farmed, the Spartios could dedicate their entire lives to what made life worth living. War. And so Sparta became the first nation ever to possess a permanent standing army, all off the backs of pathetic helots. This posed a problem, however, as the helots quickly came to outnumber the Spartiotes, but Lycurgus had a solution for everything. Get this. He killed them all. Genius. Well, he didn't actually kill them all. He just legalized killing helots for shits and giggles, sometimes hunting them for sport, just to remind them who's boss. This policy of state terrorism would keep the helots in line, at least until the foreigners got involved, but let's not think about that. The rest of the Spartan system was simple. The two kings remained in power but had major limitations. The Ephori made sure the kings Apella and Gerusai didn't do anything stupid, the Gerusai was the House of Commons and the Apella was the House of Lords. A perfect tripartite power structure with no flaws at all. But what good is a perfect political system tailored to a permanent state of war if it isn't used? It's time for war! But who to attack? Pretty much everything else in Laconia is useless hills and goat herders. There doesn't seem to be anything to conquer. Oh, wait, there is. There's one shithole called what? Uh, Messania? And so, for justification, the Messanians raided a Spartan radio tower, I mean, some cattle, and something, uh, the Spartans attacked. The Aegean king of Sparta at the time, Alcmenes, led a genius night attack on the city of Amphia, swiftly capturing, sacking, and enslaving the city. But after that, the war was just a stalemate, as the Messanians cowered behind the walls of their cities and the Spartans just walked around the unprotected countryside, pillaging what they could. This lasted so long that Alcmenes died and was succeeded by Polydorus, and it was at this time that the Messanians, led by Euphaes, decided to leave their cities and attack the Spartans at Amphia. However, the Spartans had a trick up their sleeve, a brand new invention called the Phalanx, where the soldiers were packed into a tight, unbreakable formation using six meter long Sarissa spears to impale their enemies. Though the formation was slow and unmaneuverable, with appropriate cavalry support, it was an unstoppable force in battle, and it was outside Amphia that it saw its first use. The Messanians charged the Spartans like the idiots they were, but the Spartans assumed their phalanx formation and butchered the regular Sagrotes. Within a few hours, the battle was over, and the Messanians retreated back to what they did best, hiding in fortifications like bitches, this time, the highly defensible Mount Ithorme. Desperate and outnumbered, the Messanians consulted the Oracle of Delphi, who told them that only the sacrifice of a royal virgin would save Messania. 
But this was a prank, and the Bassanian king Aristodemus found that out the hard way. They sacrificed his daughter for nothing. Meanwhile, the Spartans chilled for a few years, letting the Bassanians starve in their mountain while they conquered the rest of Messania, later marching on Mount Iphome and killing the Messanian leadership. Aristodemus led a desperate offensive against the Spartans, but was crushed, and not wanting to live in a world ruled by their rightful Spartan masters, killed himself. Iphome then fell, the Messanians were enslaved, and the land was now under Spartan ownership. And that is where we end today's video. Thank you for watching. If you like this content, please be sure to like and subscribe. And I'd just like to apologize for not uploading for, what was it, like two months now? Yeah, I had exams and lots of schoolwork to do, but now they're done, and I'll be working a lot more on this channel. With that out of the way, till next time.